Hey guys, welcome to my black and white film developer buying guide. So having done three very in-depth black and white film guides in the past and having helped a lot of photographers find an entry point into the world of film, I figured those guides were not quite complete without a guide for chemical development as well. It's important to recognize that the choice of developer and the way that you use the developer is just as important as the decision of what film to use. Chemicals, their dilution, their time, their temperature, the amount of agitation you use, all of this has a significant impact on contrast, sharpness, graininess, and density of your negatives. Beyond that, there are just a ton of developers out there, far more than any one photographer could adequately test in one lifetime. For the purposes of this video, we will not exhaustively be covering every available developer. Our more modest goal is just to introduce the top 12 best-selling black and white developers available in the US currently, and show some side-by-side -side examples with four of the top-selling black and white films. Now, to procure all of that solution on all of that film, it wasn't cheap, and so I'm very happy to announce to you that this video was funded and made possible by the excellent folks at KEH.com. If you don't know who KEH is, I would definitely recommend getting to know them. For those of you who know Danae and I, you know that we are big proponents of used gear, both film and digital, and one of the first places I look for great used gear is KEH. KEH is the world's largest camera store dealing in used gear, and what we love most about them is that they thoroughly inspect all of their gear, they have a conservative grading system, and they have a 180-day warranty. With expensive photo gear, it's really risky to rely on private sellers, but KEH mitigates that risk and we love using them. So check them out at KEH.com and Enter Danae ampersand Andrew at checkout for 5% off your next purchase. Now for this study, as I mentioned, I did go out and shoot the exact same scene on four different films, and then I developed each of those four different films in 12 different developers. It was a pretty big undertaking, and I considered doing a blind test like I've done before with our black and white film um, guides, but the problem here is that there are so many variables when you think about chemicals that I just didn't think that um, the one way we developed all these films would adequately represent all of the different characteristics that these different developers have. Instead, I'll simply use my photos as an example to show at least some of the main characteristics of each of the developers. The films I chose to use cover the range of films very well. I went with T-Max 100, Tri-X 400, HP 5 Plus, and Delta 3200. For each developer, I used the box speed of the film, not doing any pushing or pulling, though some will argue that Delta 3200 is actually pushed from 1600, but I'm not an expert on that film. For the scene, I thought I'd try to do something fairly high contrast and which might lend itself to black and white shoot. An obvious idea that popped in my head um, was from Spy vs. Spy, a favorite comic from my childhood. So for this scene, I found a nice street corner and alley with some backlighting for the black spy and some front lighting for that white spy. And I set it up on a tripod. I shot two rolls of film with each of the four types of film all with consistent settings. For development, I used the recommended dilutions of the manufacturers and the times from the massive dev chart. For temperature, I kept everything at 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and for fixer, I used Ilford Rapid Fixer. For scanning, I used the Epson V800 with as consistent settings as I could, other than the black and white points, which I set from the point picker at consistent places, the most white and the most black point of each film. As a result of that, it's difficult to really get an exact idea of how contrast compares with each film, but as I said before, there are too many variables there to make an exact science of this anyway, so um, you won't rely on the photos themselves for contrast, more of what um, patterns I've been able to see in my research. For comparison, I've created some side-by-side -side contact sheet style composites, four of them, one for each of the four films that will show you how each one did with each film developer. You can download that and study those at your leisure, the link is below. But I'll show them briefly here on screen so you can pause and at least get a cursory look of how each of these compare. So we'll cut to that now and then we'll come back and dive into a brief description and comparison of each of the 12 developers that we chose to focus on for this study. Mm -hmm. 
far as these 12 developers go, I suppose the most natural place to start is with the world's oldest developer that is still in production, and that is Rodinal. Rodinal was patented in 1891 and is still today one of the most common and beloved black and white developers. Since the patent has long expired on it though, Rodinal now comes in several forms and from several companies. The most common are Adox Rodinal, what we have here which is Compard R9 One-Shot, and Blazonol, for those of you who are in Canada, you'll be more, more familiar with that. But the recipe for Rodinol is also well known and simple. It's actually not hard to create your own, just using three simple ingredients. That's Tylenol tablets, sodium sulfite, and sodium hydroxide. Rodinol is a one-shot film, and that just means that you mix it, when you mix the stock and develop with it, you, you chuck it when you're done. It has an extremely long shelf life. Most folks who shoot with it agree that it will last years, if not decades. Once diluted though, it will need to be used immediately and then discarded. It can be diluted anywhere from one to 25 and one to 100. At one to 25, it's a fast developer and it will come at the expense of sharpness. Whereas at the higher dilutions, you can get the benefit of stand or semi-stand development, which requires less babysitting and it will also increase edge sharpness. In general, Rodinol adds more accutance or perceived edge sharpness than most of the other developers we'll be talking about. Most of the developers tend to dissolve or eat away at the silver in the chemistry, which blurs the sharp edges of the silver grains in the emulsion, but Rodinol won't do that, so it means increased sharpness overall. However, that comes with a price when it comes to faster speed films like Delta 3200. The grain is going to be extremely apparent when using Rodinol. Finally, Rodinol is extremely cheap. RO9, for example, depending on the dilutions you use, will run you somewhere around 47 US cents per roll. The next liquid developer we'll be talking about is Ansel Adams' favorite developer. This is Kodak HC110. Kodak HC110 is extremely versatile and very affordable. Like Rodinol, this syrupy, viscous, amber-colored goop will last for years. As such, most HC110 users will recommend only creating the solution you need by extracting the amount that you need with a syringe from the stock rather than diluting it the whole batch, which will go bad much more quickly. HC110 was created to provide photographers with shorter times to complete development, with most 400 speeds taking around five and a half minutes to develop, although this leaves less room for error and some photographers recommend thinner dilutions and longer development times for more consistency and flexibility. But for those of us pressed first time, this really is a great choice. In its more standard development times, HC110 is known for yielding very fine or softer appearing grain than Rodinol, but it's also going to be more contrasty than many other films with highlights that can be difficult to control and shadows that often lose detail. For photographers like me who love a lot of contrast and don't mind that straight off a of scan, this can be great. But for those who prefer low contrast negatives or those who prefer to control the contrast levels in post or enlargement, you may want to steer clear or use lighter dilutions with longer development times. But of all the developers I'm talking about today, HC110 is probably the most affordable, again depending on how you use your dilutions, averaging probably around 28 US cents per roll developed. Our next developer is very similar to Kodak's HC110. It's Ilford's cheapest black and white developer, which is its knockoff version of Kodak HC110. This is Ilford Ilfotec HC. Like HC110, Ilfotec was designed to be flexible and for general use. The HC in the title of both developers ostensibly stands for highly concentrated. As expected, in the photos I got, we see extremely similar results to HC110. In my comparison, the T-Max film is almost indistinguishable when developed in the two HC developers. The only thing you might could say about the higher ISO films is that Infotech HC seems to yield higher accutants, but that is also going to result in more grainy appearance, but only slightly. And I'm not sure if it's just in my single test or not, but the black seemed to get lost with Delta 3200 in Ilfotec HC. Other than that, the contrast curve is similar and you'll probably get similar details out of the shadows. Ilfotec HC is the cheapest of the Ilford developers, in the US at least, it is still twice as expensive per roll than HC 110, coming in at about 46 uh, cents per roll if you develop in the one to 31 dilution. And in my mind, 
I can't really see how Ilfotec HC is a better option than the Kodak variety to hobbyists or those newer to film photography. Next, we have the TMAX developer, which confusingly has absolutely nothing to do with TMAX film. And contrary to the assumption of many new, new photographers, it isn't even particularly good for developing with TMAX film, where something like XTAL might be more suited for the task of developing T-grain emulsions. TMAX was developed specifically for small tank or rotary tube development. Like HC110, it was designed for one-time use. But unlike HC110, TMAX does not have the same shelf life. Once you open it, you've probably got about six months to develop all of this solution. As far as development, TMAX has an average development time, which are a bit longer than HC110. TMAX is known for boosting shadow detail and probably does better than just about any developer for boosting details in the shadow. It works really well for pushing films past their standard development ISOs gracefully, although the opposite isn't true. I wouldn't recommend pulling with TMAX. Additionally, because it is highly active, it can result in excessive highlight density if you're not careful. As far as grain, TMAX is going to accentuate it. So if you wanna use Kodak, but you don't like grain, you're probably gonna be more comfortable with HC110 or XTAL, which we'll talk about in a moment. As far as price, TMAX comes in at about $1.15 per roll, making it quite a bit more expensive than HC110, for instance. And between that and the decreased shelf life, I really think you have to be in love with the way TMAX processes things to choose it over HC110 or Rodnell, especially if you're new to black and white film processes. Many say that Ilfotec DDX is Ilford's answer to Kodak's TMAX developers. Others argue it is more comparable to D76, which we'll talk about in a moment, though the latter claim seems to be much less likely to me. DDX is a developer designed for home users who like to obtain the highest possible speeds with small grain definition. Like TMAX, it provides good shadow detail, but without excessive highlight density. DDX handles grain with film pushed extremely well. It is the developer of choice for many who push 400 speed films or shoot with Delta 3200. Here compared to TMAX you can see that while they do appear very similar the grain with DDX is less obvious. And like TMAX or maybe even more so DDX will soften the heck out of low speed and T-grain films as you can see here with TMAX 100. The stated shelf life of the stock solution of DDX is longer than TMAX at 24 months in fully tight capped bottles or six months in half tight capped bottles. At $1.46 USD per roll at the most common dilution of one to four, DDX is less economical than other developers and slightly less economical than even Kodak TMAX. Though if you plan to shoot at higher speeds and low light quite a bit, you might prefer it. It might be perfect for your needs. Ilfasol 3 is our next liquid developer, also by Ilford. There isn't much information that I could find about this compared to some of the other developers. It just doesn't seem as popular. Those who have used it often complain that it has a short shelf life and having it suddenly stop working without warning sooner than expected. As far as characteristics, it seems well suited to 100 speed films with both high contrast fine grain and ideal sharpness balance for those speeds. However, any accidental overexposing and the grain will be extremely enhanced. Some also complain that the highlights are almost always blown out with it. At the recommended dilution of one to nine, this developer will run about 60 cents per roll. So that covers most of the liquid developers that I compared, though we'll come back to one more liquid developer at the very end. But first, I want to turn our attention now to some of the powder developers. The first powder developer we'll talk about is actually a really good one to compare to the developer we just spoke about, Ilfosol 3, and that is Ilford's Perceptol. Like Ilfosol 3, Perceptol is designed specifically for fast speed films. But where Ifosol was designed for sharpness, Perceptol is designed for fine grain. They have similar shelf life, but Perceptol is going to cost around twice as much as Ilfosol. But one of the drawbacks of using Perceptol are the development times, which are extremely long. Next up, we'll talk about Kodak's classic D76 developer. D76 was introduced in 1927 and even today is considered by many to be the standard. Virtually all films made today work well with it and it's a good choice if you plan to develop at normal box speeds. D76 comes as a powder mix and unlike many of the other powder mixes, it only has one part. Using D76 one to one, it represents probably one of the best compromises between sharpness and grainlessness. With medium development times, it's also flexible and forgiving for mistakes, making it an excellent choice for newer photographers. 
When I started into film photography, D76 was recommended to me, so I used it. But I found that after a few months, it will start to turn a yellowish brown if exposed to too much air, and it starts to lose potency after two months when not stored properly. If you're better at keeping it in airless containers than I was, you might get six months or even more out of it. But D76 is not terribly expensive at just 56 cents per roll if you always use the one-to-one -one dilution. So even if you don't use it all, it's not a terrible loss. And on the Ilford side of things, once again, they have a competing similar product in Ilford ID11. Like D76, it is an all-purpose developer, best suited for processing at normal box speeds. Also like D76, it is supposed to dissolve the edges of grain, giving a fine, softer grain look. It has the same flexibility, both in dilutions and development times, and it's as forgiving with mistakes as D76. However, it is twice as expensive per roll in the US as D76. While D76 represents the standard for home development, for many, XTAL represents Kodak's professional development standard. In the grand scheme of things, XTAL is actually relatively new, coming out at the turn of the century. When it first came out, um, though there were some problems with it, they, they sold it in smaller volumes as well, and the powder was inconsistent and prone to early expiration. As a result today, Kodak only offers it in bulk mix size, which creates more than a gallon of stock solution and which isn't super convenient to store. It doesn't have an extremely long shelf life either, with eight months max when stored in a completely air-safe container. And unlike D76, which begins to turn that yellowish brown color when it begins to expire, Xtol is more binary. When it expires, it does so immediately and it gives you no discoloration as a warning. As a result, after a few months of use, many Xtol users opt for a clip test to ensure viability before development. But on the positive side, Xtol is one of the few developers that does not contain hydroquinone, which is supposedly better for the environment. Better to not have that for the environment. Kodak claims that Xtal produces relatively high acutance or perceived sharpness compared to other developers with enlargeability of the negatives 10% greater than equivalent sharpness and grain than say D76. Xtal tends to produce an S-shaped curve characteristic um, with a maximum contrast in the mid-tones, whereas HC110 and T-Max developers produce that upswept characteristic curve with relatively high contrast in the highlights. As a result, many claim it's easier to control highlights with Xtal. Due to the large quantity of this powder, the price of Xtal is very cheap. If you always develop one-to-one, -one, for instance, you'll get about 30 cents per roll, so any loss in expired liquid may not be that big of a deal. Switching back to the Ilford side of things, Microfen is a bit of a specialized developer. It's also a powder developer with a two-part mix and, like most of our mixes, doesn't have an extraordinary shelf life once the stock is mixed. And also, like other powder developers, the development times of Microfen are extremely long. It's not a film I'd recommend unless you need it for very specific circumstances, and those circumstances are for when you want to push slow-speed films. This developer is specifically designed to increase film speeds. It also reduces grain size with high speed to grain ratio. At the one to one dilution, Microfen is the same price as Ilford's ID11 at about $1.08 per roll. The last developer on our list is a bit different than all the liquid um, one shots or our powder developers. This is a reusable liquid film um, from Cinestill called DF96. This is a recent player on the black and white development scene, but what makes this developer special is that it is a monobath. And that means that you can develop your film with just one step. This solution contains both traditional development chemicals as well as time-released mixer, mixer, fixer time-release fixer, which some consider to be a simpler process and a time saver, though we'll come back to the realities of how much time it will really save you. One batch of the one liter container of Cinestill DF96 will develop a total of 16 rolls of film, but the moment you open this stuff up, you have just two months to use it before it expires. With this developer, overprocessing is impossible since the fixing action overtakes the chemical development. And Cinestill likes to say that it only takes three minutes to develop the film, but that's only true if you plan to develop your film at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is obviously more than the standard 75 degrees that most professionals say to develop at, or the 68 degrees room temperature that most home hobbyist developers prefer. For the latter club, you can still develop this at room temperature, but you'll need to double the development times to six minutes. But even then, sure, it's certainly more fast and efficient than the traditional developer for fixer processes, but not by much. And even the advantage there is lost once you consider that you have to add an additional 15 seconds 
um, for each additional roll until you reach the 16 roll maximum um, or eight minutes of time, after which it is no longer good. So while the claim of three minutes and one step sounds nice, the realities are that it will take longer uh, most of the time. Beyond that, the developer does a pretty good job under circumstances for which it was designed, specifically when comparing it to HC110 with other cubic grain films like HP5 Plus or Triax, it seems right there with it. It does a good job. Good accutant, similar contrast, but a little bit of loss of detail in the highlights and shadows. The other awesome advantage here is that all the cubic grain film is going to be able to be developed in the same developer. So combining two different rolls of the same in the same container of different types is no issue at all, which can also be a huge time saver, especially if you're experimenting with different types of films to see what you like best. However, I would never recommend DF96 with T-grain films like T-Max where the results are milky at best from what I've experienced. Nor does it seem to be a good pick for pushing film very far or for more sensitive films like with Delta 3200 where you can see the shadows are just destroyed. So with those things in mind, it's clear that this developer was designed for hobbyists in home use and for newer film photographers. So those are the 12 developers I chose to work with and a bit of an introduction for each. There are others like PMK Pyro or Diafine that I didn't talk about, but certainly I could have. But I had to draw the line somewhere, guys. Um, as far as my personal recommendations, if you're new to film photography, some of the cheaper but tried and true developers may work best. If you'd rather work with liquid developers, HC110, Ilfotech HC, or Rodinol are excellent options and will help you start getting into a groove. If you would prefer powder, D76 or ID11 are certainly excellent and flexible ways to start. For those of you looking for better results specific to certain types of film, you may want to consider two different sets of chemicals for the slower speed speed or T-grain films like T-Max 100, Delta 100, or Pan F+, you may choose Rodinol or something like Perceptol while maybe considering something like DDX, T-Max, or Microfen for pushing 400 speeds or greater films. But regardless, I'd sure love to hear what you end up deciding in the comments. If there are corrections or things you'd like uh, me to keep in mind for future versions of this comparison, please let me know. While there's only so much I can do in one comparison like this without it being completely untenable, I'm sure that I will make improvements and do this again in years to come. Every year or so, I'll probably do an update. But in the meantime, thanks again to KEH for sponsoring. Long live film. We'll talk to you again real soon.